Welcome to the Dach Anwender Treffen introduction, uh, the English part. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. And uh, yeah, we just start because we have one hour and we want to fill it with interesting stuff. So this is the introduction, um, as I said, and uh, introduction starts um, with what is a container? So we start with this topic. You see here the agenda. You get an architectural overview. You get the newest features from OpenShift, um, some information on that for VMs and Windows containers, some words about the ecosystem uh, around OpenShift and the platform services and Red Hat training and question and answering um, at the end. So a lot of um, topics to cover. And we will start. So what do we have? We have the OpenShift container platform. And the OpenShift container platform is a big thing in the meantime. Like we have uh, several layers included. And you will see the layers um, during the presentation again. Um, so we um, try to cover from bottom to top what is the OpenShift container platform and what is it consisting of? So we start with the first part, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux and RHEL CoreOS part. And um, to understand this part, we have to talk about what are containers and where are they coming from? So if you look the traditional workloads, we have um, some infrastructure, some computing servers, and an operating system on top of it. Um, installed in the operating system, there are the binaries and libraries. And on top of this, the application one, two, and three are running and uh, are provided to the customers. So the thing is, if you have an update from an application or a security update in the op operating system or in the binaries and libraries, everything has to be compatible to each other, which is sometimes uh, no effort, but sometimes it's um, really hard because uh, some application does not work with the, no the newest um, binaries you're providing as base of it. So what have we done in the last 20 years in IT? We started to virtualize you're all familiar with the virtual machines, um, as you see it here in the in the middle graphic. Um, we have now a hypervisor um, above the infrastructure, and we have our guest OS and binaries and libraries and application bundled together in a virtual machine, which is a very nice concept. It's good handleable. Um, there's a lot of automation going on in the network and storage domains, but um, as you know, a guest OS doesn't come for free. It needs a lot of CPU power and it needs a lot of RAM. Um, so cost-wise, infrastructure-wise, um, something to handle. And um, if you start up a VM, it's not a thing of uh, milliseconds. There are, yeah, let's say um, some part of a minute is uh, going on time um, that you have started your VM um, until the application on top of it is available. So what do we do now in the new world or now since, yeah, let's say five years, five, six years, um, containers are coming in. Um, so we are using the host operating system um, kernel features and build on top of that uh, a bundle called container where we take in the binaries and libraries and the applications and um, so we have a lot smaller workload to present our service to the end customer and as you see on the right graphics there's some space left now where the guest os was what do we do with this space we stage more applications so um, as you see here, graphically simply uh, visualized, um, you can run a lot more uh, containers on an infrastructure than on um, a virtual machine-based infrastructure, um, which is 
especially interesting when you're going to public clouds where your resources are um, paid directly. So if you need less resources, it's, um, it's, it's, it's essentially cheaper at the end. So what are container um, in, the, in the technically world? Um, a container, it's at the end, it's just a process. It's a Linux process or most time it's a Linux process. I come to that later. Um, we have namespaces to isolate this process because process can intercommunicate. Processes are like um, in a, on an operating system. Um, they're not really secure um, if, if there's some uh, breaching point. So what we do with the namespaces, which is a Linux kernel feature, we isolate the process. We isolate it in several domains, like, for example, the file system or the PIDs and the network. So um, if something happens into a container or in the process, it's hard to break out of the jail you see on the right side. So we um, take the process and say to this point and not further, um, if something happens, um, this is the this is the point where you can't go to other processes. Um, what we call this is a container at the end. So it's a process with some definitions, what they can do and where they can run. Another thing is um, a process can, um, there's, there's some, there's some uh, nice process and there's some, um, uh, there's some mechanisms uh, uh, since years in the in the Linux kernel where you can prioritize um, which process um, is how important. Um, but if you have uh, some more processes, it's good to say like this process can only use 25% of my CPU. This process can only use 25% of my RAM. So. Um, uh, in case you have a lot of going on in the hardware, um, you have uh, said like you have under control which process can use which resources. So this is another um, kernel feature. It's called C groups, and this is also part of a container. The definition: how many resources can a process use? A container in the uh, Kubernetes, OpenShift world or container world is the smallest compute unit. So it's the smallest running process, the, the smallest thing you can handle. Um, a container is um, consisting of a container image, which is a binary. We're providing these two, um, like the base images, and uh, they're called Ubi. If you want to look up, um, it's a very good idea to use proven and certified base images. Um, so we provide these as Red Hat 2. Um, as I said, like they're called UBI, universal base images. Um, if you take an image and let it run as a container with the specs, uh, I just described the slides before, it's called a container. So the container is a running, um, a running image, a running process. Um, containers or container images are always um, saved in an image registry. So if someone says it, uh, or if it is it Kubernetes or an administrator by hand, I want to run this and that container, um, it's always uh, taken out of an image registry, um, which is uh, an essential feature um, for Kubernetes, I'm coming to this later. But um, as I said, like for now, every container is coming out of a container image, which is saved in image registry. So um, when we're talking about Kubernetes, I said it, um, the, said it some seconds before, um, we're talking about pods. What are pods? Pods are the smallest unit in the Kubernetes world. A pod consists at least of one container, but it can take more than one container. 
So what is it, how is it defined? A pod is always um, a, a service which is represented by an internal IP address and can then uh, addressed via this IP. So it can contain more than one container. Um, if only one of the containers is like communicating to the outside and the other container is, for example, something providing which is only internally of the service needed maybe a sort algorithm or a, an AI, KI um, uh, algorithm or something like that. And the front end is then the only uh, container which has a, a connection to the outside. And so it's only only one um, pod is needed, which can contain more than one container. So now we have these containers, like all these Linux processes with definitions, what they can use and how they're jailed. And we have um, a lot of Linux processes over um, a con over a lot of machines distributed, and um, this uh, has to be handled somehow. As you see here in this picture, um, a lot of containers in a harbor. Um, yeah, very nice picture. It's colorful and everything, but um, if you don't have someone who distributes the container, they will stay in the harbor forever, and everything what is inside the container will never come to the customer, which is not uh, very useful. So we need someone who handles uh, all the containers, and this is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the second layer uh, of OpenShift here in this um, visual in this graphics um, to say some words about OpenShift and Kubernetes relation. OpenShift is an enterprise Kubernetes distribution. So we have the standard Kubernetes integrated. We are number two contributor um, to Kubernetes open source code uh, after Google. And um, everything you can run on Kubernetes or which is what is Kubernetes compatible is also OpenShift compatible because, as I said, OpenShift is another Kubernetes distribution with a lot of services on top of it, but it includes the Kubernetes layer as it's used all over the world. This um, slides or the next two slides are coming from Kubernetes.io. So this is the official way to explain what, what can Kubernetes uh, do for you. Kubernetes and what can it do for you? Uh, Kubernetes is responsible for the, for the service discovery and load balancing. So it stages up the containers and it um, load balances the traffic from outside to the different containers. So um, if a new container is, um, uh, is, is run, that the traffic is then coming to it and handled by it. Um, in this domain, um, it's very good to have someone who knows which uh, node is um, used with, with what resources or which resources are free on which node. So um, this is also handled by Kubernetes. Uh, it's called automatic bin packing. So every container runs on um, the node which is um, optimal and has the free resources um, to run the container. Um, as needed and defined. If one of the containers is dying, like um, shutting down because of a memory leak or something that uh, something similar, um, there's a self-healing capability. So you say um, in the Kubernetes layer, I want to have run my container or my service three times in three different data centers. And if one of the three containers fails, Kubernetes takes over and uh, restarts the container. So the service is always available as you have defined. Um, Kubernetes by itself and containers by itself um, don't provide persistent storage. So um, if a container is shut down, decommissioned, um, all the data produced and handled in the container will be deleted. But of course, um, there are scenarios where you need persistent storage. Um, so you mount some persistent storage to the container and this is handled by Kubernetes too. So if you want a database or something like that run, running in a container, um, 
you just um, say to Kubernetes, I want uh, this volume mounted to this container and Kubernetes will handle it. Um, something very usable um, in, in Kubernetes or a scenario what you have always in, in operating or in IT scenarios is how to handle all the secrets, um, like the key material, passwords and stuff like that. And um, if you have uh, like the construct of a development team and an operating team, uh, you don't want to give out uh, the database, the production database uh, keys to the development team um, because there, there's some security breach possible then. So um, uh, you just say to the developers, listen, dear developer, here is an um, environment variable um, which contains the um, secret and I will take care of um, injecting the secret um, uh, that the database then can be accessed. So this is also a Kubernetes function, um, secret and configuration management. Um, it just um, injects the secrets in the containers, so um, it's handled on another layer and it doesn't have to be inside the container or in a Git repository or stuff like that. Um, then the automated rollouts and rollbacks, and this is where I reference back to the registry. Um, the registry allows Kubernetes to have several versions of a container in the registry. So if a newer version is um, coming out of a, of a software, of a container, um, Kubernetes can roll it out. Um, and uh, as it handles the traffic to Kubernetes, um, it can like a handle um, that uh, the traffic is then rerouted to the um, new container version. And um, when some container doesn't have any traffic anymore on it, um, it can be replaced by the newer version. This goes back to, so if the new version has some uh, failures and bugs in it, you can make the process in the, in the other direction. And uh, this is then not called a rollout, it's called a rollback. But um, yeah, technically it's exactly the same uh, mechanisms that are going on. And also for this scenario, um, both of the versions have to be available in a central place. And as I said, this is called the registry in, in the uh, container and Kubernetes environments. So from the same side, um, Kubernetes and what it can't do for you. Uh, it does not deploy source code and it does not build your application. So continuous integration delivery is possible with Kubernetes, but only as a component, not as, um, as a service. Um, it, it provides the, the APIs and everything to, to implement um, CICD pipelines and workflows, but it does not provide it by itself. Um, it does not provide application level services such as middleware and frameworks and databases. And it does not come with logging, monitoring and alerting. These are other um, services implemented by other um, products, but not by Kubernetes itself. Uh, Kubernetes only provides the integration and APIs to have an to, to provide these other services. So, how do we handle these shortcomings of Kubernetes with OpenShift? OpenShift um, uh, in uh, the Kubernetes or in the operational uh, view um, brings the uh, cluster services with it on top of Kubernetes. And it's exactly what I um, showed you in the last slide. What Kubernetes can't do um, is integrated in OpenShift automatically. So we have um, etcd where the, all the configuration is saved. This is the Kubernetes um, native technology. We have the Kubernetes services as the scheduler, cluster management and API server. And this is, as I mentioned, completely implemented in OpenShift. Um, I think this is a little bit confusing because now um, we're coming from the blue to the red um, 
boxes, uh, but uh, this only visualizes that OpenShift um, is one-to-one -one compatible with the Kubernetes services as it's implemented, like the Kubernetes layer is implemented in OpenShift. But um, these are like the same services um, at the end. Um, then we're coming to the infrastructure services needed on top of Kubernetes. And I'm talking about monitoring, logging, tuning, software-defined networks, and so on. Um, so we need these services on every node, which is providing um, the containers at the end. So the stuff I um, uh, begin with in this slide set um, are, the, are running on master service, master servers, which are um, respon responsible for the um, configuration handling. And the containers itself are running on worker nodes. So monitoring, logging, and so on is needed on the worker nodes um, because this is where the containers are running at the end. Um, as I said, we have a registry we're integrating in OpenShift. This is not part of Kubernetes. Um, so OpenShift integrates a registry to handle um, what a registry has to handle, the container images. Um, we're bringing the monitoring, uh, we have implemented the monitoring within um, uh, OpenShift with um, Prometheus and Grafana to visualize it. And we have an alert manager, so every new container is automatically monitored. And um, yeah, the same goes for um, log aggregation, so all the logs from the different containers are saved in an Elasticsearch database and can be visualized and filtered by Kibana, which is a de facto standard in the um, container world. And we have an, um, like an, uh, an advanced routing um, implementation, um, which brings some more features uh, for encryption, TLS encryption and stuff like that on top of the um, uh, usual uh, uh, or the integrated Kubernetes ingress um, model. Um, OpenShift has some features which were wished by customers um, that we implemented to um, yeah, satisfy the customer needs. And so there's um, an advanced routing uh, interface implemented in the OpenShift clusters. Um, everything I talked about is API compatible. Um, so it can be integrated with your existing automation tool sets if you're an administrator, and it can be integrated by developers um, in the uh, Git hooks or other CI CD um, uh, scenarios. So um, what I want to show you in the in this slide is one of the newest features. It's like four or five um, months old. So I started with from containers to virtual machines to, um, sorry, from traditional workloads to virtual machines to containers. And um, I said like containers need less resources and, and are better in any way. They start up faster and everything. So, but the VMs won't go away this fast. And containers uh, have several advantages, um, not only that they use less resources, um, also the other stuff like Kubernetes with the self-healing um, and, and, and the rollout and everything. So what we have done is we put now virtual machines into containers so we can integrate the virtual machines in all these features um, I showed you in the last slides. Um, so virtual machines can easily be integrated in continuous integration, continuous delivery scenarios, and they can run side by side with container to provide an application and service at the end. Um, this is all, everything is running on, on the same um, OpenShift cluster. And um, yeah, it does not stop here. Um, it goes further. Um, in the last version, we have now uh, also integrate Windows containers. Um, Windows containers are a little bit different from Windows virtual machines, for example, because they're using, um, as on the first container picture, the 
Microsoft Windows kernel features and only bring the APIs and uh, binaries with it um, to, to be run as container. Um, so now in the latest version of OpenShift, um, we now support um, these Windows containers. This means um, we can integrate worker nodes with Microsoft Windows running on it. And on top of that, you can then run Windows containers. Um, on the left side, you have the Windows virtual machines, which are the traditional or the more traditional um, approach to run Windows workload. And um, uh, everything is then um, going in to one administration interface, to one API interface, and this is the Red Hat OpenShift container platform. So all workloads now possible uh, to run on OpenShift. Um, as you see, like it's really complex um, to bring all this tooling together. Um, we are installing, deploying, harden, and then operate it. Um, it takes a lot of effort. And um, so the, the sentence here on top, Kubernetes done right is hard. I think everyone in operating can relate to it. Um, if you have so many technologies and products integrated together, um, it's hard um, to keep everything up to date and um, to keep it working together in, in the proper and secure way. Um, so all I told you is integrated in um, OpenShift. And um, that's um, wh why I call and Red Hat calls OpenShift the trusted enterprise Kubernetes. So at the left, we see all this open source projects and the Kubernetes release, we secure it, we, we tie it together, we make it production ready, and we make an OpenShift release out of it. Um, we're not the only ones uh, who are providing this for our customers. Um, also, other people are relying on the OpenShift platform because um, uh, when you have a software product and you can't um, guarantee that it's um, running stable on the platform at the customer. Um, sometimes it's firing back to the service provider, um, which is providing the software. And it's only like, like the, the software is not stable. But it's not the software, it's the platform which is not stable. So um, a lot of um, uh, independent software vendors um, have decided to say, OK, if we provide our software as a container, we certify it on OpenShift, so we can guarantee that it's run and, and uh, maintainable on a secure and reliable way. Um, so we have a, a really broad ecosystem, and um, it's increasing weekly, um, where um, ISVs say, OK, I want to rely on an, on an, uh, on an enterprise Kubernetes platform and um, guarantee everything is working as I want it in the development or as I uh, defined it in the development. Um, with this, I'm going to uh, I'm take uh, I'm handing over to Gianluca Lupo, which is um, uh, giving you some inputs about the developer services uh, which are provided by OpenShift. One of the challenges that the enterprises are facing today, uh, rest assured that there is the platform on the backbone, like Marius was explaining, containers, uh, uh, container orchestration platforms. Again, one of the main challenges that the main enterprises are facing today is how they should, how they would modernize and migrate their current application into a cloud native ready uh, application to be hosted into a container and to be executed into a Kubernetes based distribution like OpenShift it is. So uh, we are going to focus right now in the in one layer of uh, um, in one layer of OpenShift that it's called the platform service. And this layer is exactly this uh, is exactly uh, highlighted in this picture. And today I'm going to talk a little bit and introduce a little bit about service mesh, serverless, and the CI CD pipelines in order to provide hints or in order to provide highlights on technologies that could be used on the uh, application modernization and strategies from companies. Right. 
So let's have a look, first of all, at, at service mesh. Um, so a service mesh is a, a technology that it's used for microservices, right? So before talking about service mesh, let's try to talk about microservices. What are microservices at the end? It is, um, in few words, microservices and architectural styles that breaks applications into a collection of smaller components. All together, these uh, uh, components, they rebuild the logic of the application that have, uh, have, has been split. So um, normally, microservices are uh, single parts, both are independently deployable. They are bounded to a context, so they are really uh, linked to domain-driven design. They can be owned by a small team, and they are often stateless. Um, on, the, on the opposite, monolithics are applications that are built where bundling together UI, business logic, data access layer. Typical example is a, a typical J2E application. There is nothing wrong with this, uh, two, um, these two uh, paradigms, with these two architectures. But on the other way around, um, microservices become more and more popular because of the latest trends that come to IT in the IT market in the last year, like containers, like DevOps, and like cloud computing. So what are the benefits of a microservice architecture? The, there are several, but I think these are the most relevant. First of all, it's about agility. Having smaller components to develop and to deliver gives, gives the possibility to update faster, to react faster on business demands. I don't have any more to uh, rebuild completely the application. Microservices normally are highly scalable because they are small in most of cases they are stateless and they can really scale depending on the traffic on the traffic increases that can be also dynamic in terms of a dynamic uh, dynamic load they can be purpose built microservices because they are bounded to a context normally they can use uh, and they are polyglot by nature they can use whatever language they want they can use whatever framework they want to best suit the business domain that it's supposed to solve. And they are uh, improve resiliency in the application. For example, if my uh, monolith, it breaks, the entire application is down. If one of my micro microservices crashes, like was uh, saying Marius before, for a memory leak, for example, I just drop one of the business functionality. Of course, if I'm using some of these uh, modern cloud native pattern to uh, be able to keep my application up and running. More and many, many organizations today, they are using successfully microservices like Netflix, Amazon, and many, many, many others. Uh, but there is the, the, there, is, there is the contrary part. These benefits, they are not coming for free. They are not for free on adopting these technologies for organizations. There are complexities that comes with the adoption of microservices, like the possibility of handling properly the tolerance to fault, the possibility to the need of creating securing services. So in order to be able to secure the communication between the microservices and so more certificates or more uh, TLS to handle and things like that. The needs of organizational changes to handle microservices oriented architectures like the introduction of DevOps and increase the deployment policies and life cycle of every application and so on and so forth. The need of course of rebuilding properly uh, logs and hand-to-hand -end log of the uh, of the features running into a microservice oriented applica application because it is highly distributed. So I need to find the connectivity, the connection to rebuild properly the logs. What is then a service mesh? Let's try to introduce this. Service mesh is a dedicated software infrastructure layer that facilitates the service-to-service -service communication. It takes, no, it takes care of building an abstraction layer on top of the microservices providing all the cross-cutting fun functionalities needed to manage, for example, the observability, what I was saying before, needed to manage the secure communication layer with the uh, automatic uh, handling of uh, certificates, for example, needed to manage a proper navigation control, allowing advanced features like A-B testing on the cause engineering and so on and so forth. 
And what is Istio Service Mesh? Istio is an uh, open source project that it's a very famous and very widely used implementation of Service Mesh. And then what is OpenShift Service Mesh? OpenShift Service Mesh is the Red Hat distribution of, of Istio, open source project, as I was saying before, bundled together with additional other projects like Kiali, for example, that provides a UI control plane to monitor the Istio capabilities, the mesh, the service mesh capabilities, bundled together with additional tooling like Jagger, Prometheus, and Grafana to provide distributed tracing, to provide a proper observability platform out of the box on top of OpenShift. So as we can see here, uh, we have the layer OpenShift is there. Service mesh comes on top of OpenShift like an added features providing all this tooling that I was telling you before. And it simplifies at the end, it simplifies and uh, gives us a possibility to uh, have a central control plane, a central management of all my microservices that I'm running on top of OpenShift. We in Red Hat, we believe that uh, Istio is the future of developing and operating microservices. Here we can see a screen of Kiali, a screenshot of Kiali. And the, the reason why we believe that it's because uh, we trust this is the future and Red Hat is actively indeed involved in the Istio community and is helping the community to shape the future of the service mesh to introduce innovation of the service mesh into Istio. And uh, Istio is becoming more and more important in the community around the, 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 the development and the, the community about the software development, simply because it's been part of also other projects like Knative, which is one of the default, let's say it's one of the possibility to produce ingress uh, communication to Knative. And we will talk about Knative few, in a few minutes because I'm going to introduce serverless. So um, an, an O'Reilly, um, uh, according to a, a survey conducted by O'Reilly uh, in, uh, a couple of years ago, 40% of enterprises, they adopted serverless technologies or practices, and they expect to grow uh, in the next 12 or 18 months. Most of them, they are scared, let's say, they are very biggest concerns about the vendor lock-in of adopting serverless technologies. But on the other way around, the 60% has, uh, has seen already reduction of operational costs using serverless, introducing serverless in the way they operate software. And they see also a biggest benefit on possibility of scaling with the demand automatically. So we have seen a survey and we talk about OpenShift serverless from Red Hat perspective. And in Red Hat, we created a maturity model on top of serverless. And we just started talking about serverless, the so-called version 1.0, a few years ago when the AWS Lambda functions, they went, they come out and the, the possibility of execute, executing snippets of code function only for a limited execution time and just reacting on a few, uh, few sources like HTTP and so on and so forth. And there was no orchestration with the, the current status is to introduce and have serverless containers. Let's say during the years, the community has seen as very, um, a very, a very tight link between functions to be executed and containers. And so they started thinking about how to execute functions or how to execute containers in a serverless way. That's why projects like Knative that I was telling before, they started as open source and uh, they are um, integrated into uh, the containers and the container orchestration platform like Kubernetes and then OpenShift represents. The current status gives us the possibility to run serverless, not only functions, but also microservices, which means that I have the possibility to run containers running microservices in a serverless way, I can easy debug, I can test locally. They are polyglot. It's, it's the best way possible right now. But it's not the end because there is still 
a future. There is still a lot of things that are happening. And these things that are happening, it, it will bring to the next level of maturity, bringing, for example, basic state handling, not only handling uh, stateless uh, containers, but also handling a basic state, uh, state. And also, I think it's the most important, blending these uh, features of running serverless uh, computing into a platform as a service on OpenShift or Kubernetes or others in a blended way, which means it's completely agnostic and transparent for the uh, execution perspective if I'm running a function, if I'm running serverless, if I'm running a monolith or uh, many, many other way of computing my, uh, my of computing power. So. I spoke about serverless, but I think every one of you is asking what is serverless at the end. At serverless, it is about the, the possibility of uh, running application in a way that they do not require any kind of centralized server to execute them. And the possibility then to run this application reacting to events, which means that the serverless computing, it's, it's the same as is at the end even driven even driven because it reacts to event. I can have HTTP request, I can have Kafka messages and many, many others. And then my computing engine needs to be able to scale up my application reacting to event, consume the event, maybe produce a results. And when the event is consumed, it goes to, it, go, it can scale down to zero and react to the next one. It's simple, but very powerful pattern. But what does it mean supplying this pattern in Kubernetes world? It means that my container orchestration platform needs to be able to react on events, to, to be triggered by events, and needs to be able to scale up and down container responding to the container workload, to the workload, to the current workload that is happening into my, uh, into my, uh, application, right? And, with this pattern in mind, I can see that I can easily think about writing a serverless web application. I can have a, my application typically, uh, a browser sends an HTTP request. This can be seen as an event. The event is triggered by the container orchestration platform. It spins up a container. It consumes the event. It can write something in the database and gives back the request. And then the container, it's, it went to zero. It's a little bit more complex than I said, but it's, the pattern is exactly this. And if I have more requests, the container orchestration simply spin up more containers to be able to consume all my workload. And what about, uh, uh, what about having Kafka, processing a Kafka message? It's exactly the same. I have uh, a Kafka message, which is an event. It's consumed by, it's, tri it's triggering my container orchestration platform. It spin up a container, it's consumed. It does some, uh, the job that it has to do and it's over. And the same if I have multiple Kafka events, I simply, my container orchestration platform simply spin up more than one container. So um, I think anyone operating in the cloud model has seen this trouble on the left of this, uh, uh, of this slide. We talk about over provisioning when, uh, we talk about over provisioning when I'm consuming more resources in the cloud uh, provider compared to the workload, which means that I'm paying more than I'm consuming. We talk about under provisioning when I'm not able to reply, I'm not able to consume uh, to the workload coming to the system. And so, which means that I'm delivering a poor quality of services, maybe impacting my uh, revenue, right? If we go on the right side of the slide, we see what is happening if we adopt serverless. We see that there is a direct line between IT costs and business revenue, which means that there is a direct line between request, workload, and containers that are executed into the platform, giving the possibility then with the right adoption of serverless technologies to also increase and consume the uh, the density of the deployments that I can have into my cloud infrastructure with a direct impact on lowering the IT costs. What are the enablers of serverless? The enablers of serverless into Kubernetes world, uh, into Kubernetes world are two technologies. One is called Knative, the other is called Key Events, which is a specification. Kinetive is an open source project initiated by uh, Google, donated to the community, and Red Hat is one of the main contributors as a three main 
components. One is called the serving, which gives the possibility to scale up and down containers to zero into Kubernetes. Eventing, which gives the common infrastructure for consuming and producing events that stimulates an application. And then a CLI to be able to uh, manipulate all the uh, all the uh, k-native uh, technologies into Kubernetes into OpenShift through command line. What is Cloud Events? Cloud Events is a specification which is, you can find here in cloudevents.io, which has the uh, mandate, which has the aim to build an agnostic representation of events, considering the different cloud providers, uh, removing all the possible vendor lock-ins from the different uh, from the cloud providers themselves. So, what is then OpenShift Serverless? Finally, we arrived. OpenShift Serverless is another feature, like Service Mesh on top of OpenShift, that delivers smoothly and seamless this functionality to the users, providing serving capabilities, providing eventing capabilities, providing the possibility to uh, interact and delivery containerized workload on demand. But we added also, as a Red Hat, we added also the possibility of executing functions. As a developer, I really don't want to uh, to spend a lot of time on, uh, um, I really don't want to spend a lot of time maybe on creating a container, an image container that runs in the platform. Functions is the response that currently is developer preview to let the, to let the developer team to focus just on the functions that they want to deploy currently supported runtime is Quarkus, Node.js, and Go, and it may, more will come in the futures, and simply deploy the functions smoothless into the container platform, into the OpenShift, and execute the function as a Kuber, as a native uh, container, as a serverless container, as I, was telling, as, as I was telling you before. And let's move to the last piece of uh, the component. Uh, when I build application, I need uh, a CI CD, uh, CI CD uh, pipeline. So we introduce OpenShift pipelines. What is CI CD? CI CD is a practice that follows the software development practices in, into companies, right? We talk about the beginning in development. We have code, we, we code, we run, we debug. And then maybe we introduce continuous integration where we are able to build the application into a build server, right? We are able to build, test, and package. And then when we have to do the delivery, there is the release process that we have to deploy the application in the various environment. In, uh, uh, in this, in, in the today world, this activity becomes more and more complex, especially the continuous delivery, because I have multiple clouds, multiple platforms, multiple geographies. And there are specific APIs, specific uh, uh, needs for every uh, provider, right? And uh, the, the developer teams needs to handle uh, APIs for AWS, for VMware, and many, many, many others, right? What is the resolution for this in order to have a unique layer? The resolution is to use Kubernetes, is to use, uh, is to base the delivery and the, of the workload based on Kubernetes, based on specification running on containers on top of Kubernetes. And then there is the need of building also a cloud native CI CD delivery. And what it is about, it is about of being able to build container application that runs on Kubernetes being able to deliver these CI CD features in a serverless way without a centralized server, because I want to enable DevOps. I want to be able to allow any team, allow any DevOps to create as much as they require the, uh, the, the best CI CD pipeline for them. So OpenShift pipelines is our uh, proposal of providing CI CD uh, experience on top of OpenShift. It, uh, it runs pipelines of container, it provides a powerful command line tool, and it can be deployed in multiple platforms and so on and so forth. Let's move forward. And the OpenShift pipelines is based as well on an open source project called Tecton, that it's a, a derived project for Knative at the beginning, and uh, it delivers the basic components for building Kubernetes style CI CD. Today it is part of the CD Foundation, the Continuous Delivery Foundation. It's contributed by Google, Red Hat, IBMs, and many, a Pivotal, and many, many others. OpenShift pipeline architectures, then again, it's a features on top of OpenShift, 
and uh, it has tecton on the backbone and it can be provided the features to the developer console, the CLI and the integration with IDEs. Last but not least, there is the tech preview of uh, in OpenShift about OpenShift GitOps, which has the aim of uh, providing an enterprise uh, delivery of uh, distribution of Argo CD, which gives the possibility to distribute and introduce finally infrastructure as a code in, a, in, a, in the best way possible, giving the possibility to deploy my infrastructure described as a, as a code into a Git repository and keep aligned the uh, deployment server uh, into the, the, the deployment server into the various environments. And that's all. This is the wrap up. Uh, this is a platform. This is an ecosystem. We just focused on these layers. There is way, way more to be investigated. And I will advise you to continue into, into this, uh, into the today's sessions to deep dive also on other layers. I just want to talk a little bit about Red Hat training, which um, I want to introduce as a, a possibility that Red Hat provides uh, to uh, keep uh, the enterprises and the people aware and learn uh, on top of the technology that we provide. There are key benefits of uh, the trainings. There are key benefits of becoming Red Hat certified professionals. This is uh, an outcome of, um, uh, of a survey that Red Hat conducted with the various uh, companies that they use, they are using our certification. And there is a way of, uh, uh, we have multiple ways of providing this training to our customer because we simply adapt to the customer needs. So, okay, today is pandemic, so we deliver online training as a default, but in normally we would provide classroom training, uh, virtual training, online video, whatever it was very interesting and uh, suitable for the customer itself. In the scope of today, I want to show these uh, four uh, Red Hat uh, uh, certified uh, path for uh, the technologies about OpenShift and about administration and developers and about software development. And uh, I let you go then in details about these uh, certification paths. We have identified all what is required here with uh, the information about the kind of trainings you, you would like to have if you want to get the certification and you can read after that if you go into the documentation itself. So we have a one special, special certified specialist into OpenShift administration, the same for application development, as you can see, the same for application developer, and finally the same for microservice developer. Now, uh, if you have any contact, please contact my colleague Mark Heinrich, and he will provide you as much as information as possible. If you are interested on, listen from this Red Hat training. Last but not least, I want to give you some hints of uh, getting uh, introduced to our Red Hat technologies uh, that are free of charge. First, it's the, our uh, landing page, learn.openshift.com. You can have an interactive learning portal. It's very, very interesting to go there and have a first insight about OpenShift. There is our uh, super uh, uh, and impressive in terms of content, uh, uh, developers.redat.com, where you can find all tutorials, articles. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And also there is the possibility to follow our Dev Nations uh, master course and uh, also the other initiatives that you can find here. And then we have also guided dance workshop uh, in different, uh, uh, in different technologies. Here we are talking just, we just inserted these like cloud native roadshop or Quarkus and Ton work, uh, workshop that are useful for you to get introduced to.